We're trying to discover not waves of light or heat, as they discovered, Penzies and Wilson, but waves of gravity, which would be associated with the violent, explosive expansion of the earliest moments in time. This is a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the origin of the observable universe, not three minutes. There's a huge gap in time between trillions of a second and minutes after the Big Bang. And that's what we were aiming to discover with BICEP and its successor BICEP 2, because we figured, or I figured, if they won a Nobel Prize for discovering you know, what happened in the first three minutes, I would certainly win Nobel Prize for discovering what happened at the earliest possible time in the universe's physical history, which is necessary condition to produce the CMB, was that the universe had this type of beginning, or we believed it did. Welcome to Books and Ideas, the podcast where we talk to interesting people from a wide variety of fields, ranging from science to science fiction. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell. Today's episode is an interview with Dr. Brian Keating, author of the fascinating new book, Losing the Nobel Prize, a story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's highest honor. If you want to get complete show notes and learn more about Books and Ideas, please go to booksandideas.com. You can send me email at docartemis at gmail.com, voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash docartemis. And of course, you can visit and post on our Books and Ideas Facebook fan page. After Dr. Keating's interview, I'll be back with a few highlights and I'll be sharing just a few brief announcements. So, Brian, it's great to have you on Books and Ideas today. Ah, it's great to be with you, too. It's taken us a few times to actually get this together. Yeah. What I usually like to do, we're going to be talking about your book, of course, Losing the Nobel Prize, the story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's highest honor which is a very engrossing read, I must say. But I'd like to start out by having you just tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am a professor of physics with a focus on astronomy. And in particular, my subfield of astronomy is cosmology, which is the study of the origin and evolution of the entire universe. And within that subspecialty, I study the universe's first few minutes. And so we believe the universe is almost 14 billion years old, and we could discuss how we know that. But what's particularly shrouded in mystery and is of great interest to me is sort of, was there a prologue to the universe? You know, in the language of books, we always come in the middle of the story in media rays. And the question is, did the universe have a preceding chapter, a prologue, if you will, that we could perhaps unravel and unveil and read for the first time. So that's what my research focuses on. Did you start out as a kid looking in the telescope? How did you get interested in cosmology? Well, I always like to say that, you know, astronomy is the only science where you're born with the tools that you need to do it. You know, you're not born with a microscope or a particle accelerator, you know, as part of your body. But most of us are born with two refracting telescopes in our skulls, and these are our eyes. And the extension of those eyes and the increase in their capability is what I found so fascinating as a 12-year-old child. I started to be transfixed by sights in the night sky. And I live pretty close to New York City. I live just outside New York City, and yet I could see all the same nebulae and craters on the moon as Galileo did 400 years earlier in northern Italy. And so what was so fascinating to me is to get a telescope and actually look at these objects, which I had no idea about, and then wanting to understand what I was seeing and why I was seeing what I was seeing led me to do the first type of scientific research I realized in retrospect I ever did, which is, you know, way before the internet, this is 1984 or so, thinking back and trying to correlate what I saw in the night sky with the weekly Sunday New York Times. And they used to print uh, kind of a planetarium view of the heavens as seen from New York City. 
And I started to notice objects and I kind of relate them to what I saw with my eyes, namely the moon and these other bright stars or what I thought were stars, but were really planets. And that was really amazing to me to see planets and see how they change position with respect to the moon and the constellations. And then that gradually dawned upon me that I could see a lot more with a telescope. And so in the book, which is really a memoir of what it's like to be a young astronomer and get interested in astronomy and wrestle with questions of religion and theology as well as philosophy and hard science. I describe how that path took me to do this type of research and then eventually became my profession, even though I didn't have any expectation that that would be the case back at age 12. Right. And if I remember correctly, you, as a grad student, designed a very special type of telescope. Yeah, so I went to Brown University as a PhD student, and basically the first day I got there, the Nobel Prizes for that year were announced, and one of the men who won it for the discovery of a certain type of radiation that's emitted from pulsars, this gentleman, he had been a graduate student not too dissimilar from myself when he had conducted the research, which 20 years later, you know, he did it in the 70s. But as a 22-year-old or 23-year-old, he was the same age I was. And I became really fascinated with that prospect that not only could I unravel the secrets of the universe as a card-carrying astronomer building telescopes, not merely using them, but but actually building them, then using them, which is a little bit different than, you know, kind of the classic view that people have of astronomers, that we could potentially the result of the research that I could do could win a Nobel Prize for me. And that was a great uh, motivating factor for me as a graduate student. Yeah. And one of the themes that runs through your book, of course, that we're going to talk about is this whole issue of the Nobel Prize, its pros and cons, and how it influences research. I had an experience as a graduate student myself before I went to medical school. I met Rosalind Yallow, who at the time, I think might have been the only woman who had won a Nobel Prize for medicine. There's been another one since then. But I met her, this was around 79 or 80, and she told me how hard it would be as a woman in science. So in a way, I sort of got the opposite message that you got, (laughs) right? You got the message that it was doable. I got the (laughs) message that it was probably impossible. But I remember actually up until that point, being very motivated by that idea. Yeah, it's surprising that there are many different awards that Hollywood gives out or the audio recording industry gives out every year, the the, uh, theatrical arts give out. And yet, there's really only one type of prize that if a member of the public is at all knowledgeable about science that he or she could mention, and that's the Nobel Prize, which, you know, recording this on uh, December 9th, and tomorrow is December 10th. And of course, I start off the book with an event that occurs on December 10th every year, and that's not only the anniversary of the death, not birth, of Alfred Nobel, but the Nobel Prizes are are awarded every year on that date of his death. And because the Nobel Prize has taken on such prominence, I believe, in the sciences, and because the sciences and medicine as well have become so abstruse and difficult to understand for the average layperson, uh, people have really become to venerate in the in the lay community, in the civilian, so to speak, community, have come to venerate Nobel laureates with an almost godlike adoration. And that, I think, is starting to trickle down to the scientists themselves. And I was but one of many casualties that I suspect are suffering from this affliction. And the book is sort of a catharsis on that aspect of can you be a good scientist if you don't win the Nobel Prize? And it sounds ridiculous, but actually a young lady read my book and offered me the most wonderful feedback. She said, I wish I read your book 10 years ago when I was an astronomy major, because my father told me, you know, you're not a good scientist unless you win the Nobel Prize. And I didn't think I could win a Nobel Prize. And it really affected her. I think the culmination of my book is to see it for, you know, what it is. And just as you're not a loser for not winning the Academy Award in a given year or winning the presidency <laughs> in a grander stage, a more meaningful stage. Still, it's the quest. And, and really, the normal state of affairs is not to win these accolades. And so it's a byproduct of the fact that there's so few awards and so little recognition for scientists that we've come to venerate this really 
very marginal thing when it was started. It was had a very limited expectations by Alfred Nobel. And so to see what it's become and to hope to rehabilitate it before it suffers a fate of, you know, maybe collapsing in on its own weight. Those are some of the motivations for writing the book. So I'm just curious because I don't know all the physicist Nobel Prizes. The only I've ironically I've probably had two hundred scientists on my podcasts and only one Nobel laureate, Frank Wilczek. And I can't even understand what he got his Nobel Prize for, right? And I understand what the neuroscientists I talked to did. And I have, and there's one in particular I've interviewed that I really think deserves a Nobel Prize, and she'll probably never get it. But maybe even two women that I've interviewed that I think might. But one is like 95 now, so the odds are really against her. In medicine, sometimes the Nobel Prize. Because of the way they used to do it, you know, it was the the best thing of the year or whatever, rather than being something that had come up over time. The person who invented the frontal lobotomy got a Nobel Prize. Is there anything equally embarrassing in the physics Nobel Prize? <laughs> yes, there have been there have been whoppers, you know, which in retrospect maybe didn't cause the the true trauma that that lobotomy did cause. And of course, there's famous Miss Awards to people that are considered war criminals or terrorists in the Peace Prize, which is kind of ironic given the title. <laughs> but in the field of physics, there have been some embarrassments, but really only because of the very limited longevity of the power of their discovery. So for example, Einstein did not win his Nobel Prize for the theory of relativity, even seven years after the invention of the or creation of the theory of relativity, which he did in 1905 in a series of papers, that the Nobel Prize seven years later was awarded to a man named Gustav Dahlen, who is a Swede. And actually, if you want to have a higher chance of winning a Nobel Prize, you should be born Swedish or become Swedish <laughs> because they have a higher chance per capita than any country in the world. But Mr. Gustav Delenn invented a very important uh, device, surely, but it didn't exactly enjoy a very long period of time of relevancy. And nor was it more important than Einstein's theory of relativity, which took 10 more years beyond what Mr. Delenn invented, which was, and I know that you use these on a daily basis, automatic regulators and gas accumulators for lighthouses and buoys. So I always <laughs> joke, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get from here to there. You know, I don't need GPS, but if you take away my buoy and my lighthouse regulation system, I'll be sunk, no pun intended. So there have been whoppers like that. There have been Nobel Prizes awarded in physics, but for political reasons, you know, uh, Enrico Fermi won one really before and not really agreed upon that that it's even correctly awarded. Of course, he deserves, you know, sort of the highest honors possible for all of his contributions. But why he won it was in part because his wife, I believe, was Jewish and they needed to get her out of Italy. And they felt like this, you know, him having a Nobel Prize would help in the transition back to America or out of the pre-World War II fascist dictatorship, you know, bloc and Axis powers. So that, those are some. Uh, Niels Bohr, another one who had a model for the atom, which won the Nobel Prize, which we now know is, is completely inadequate to describe what actually happens. He depicted it as basically a miniature planetary solar system. And in, in fact, it's quite dissimilar to that. So there haven't been ones that have caused great trauma, although there have been some, you know, in a moral sense, just as you say, mostly to women and to minorities that have not only not won the Nobel Prize, but their work was awarded a Nobel Prize to their male PhD advisors and colleagues, similar to what happened with Rosalind Franklin. And you mentioned that the scientist that you know, this uh, perhaps the neuroscientist that you mentioned, she's 95. Well, you know, I'm here to tell you that, you know, according to their own rules, she can't win it posthumously, although they made up that rule. That was never a rule. And in fact, two Swedish men won Nobel Prizes posthumously. And one U.S. doctor eight years ago won the Nobel Prize posthumously. So they tend to bend and tweak their rules and regulations to suit their own purposes. We'll get back to how to fix the Nobel Prize if we have time, but I'd rather focus on um, your work and especially the overall picture so I'm going to just jump right to the question that comes to my mind as a as a non-cosmologist. So in your book, you're talking really about 
some evidence that you're trying to achieve that have to do with the Big Bang. So as a non-cosmologist, I had the impression that once cosmic background microwave was discovered, that, that that proved it. So will you set me straight? Yeah, so you're bringing up a very interesting aspect of cosmology, which is that every time we think we understand the answer to a previous question, we come up with at least one and sometimes multiple questions on top of that question. In other words, when we originally thought for sure the universe was eternal back in the 100 years ago and, and even after, you know, even more recently, 90 years ago, we thought the universe was eternal and unchanging. And there was plenty of evidence for that. It seemed to be that with the exception of the solar system, not much changed. And so there wouldn't be any reason to suppose otherwise, including Einstein incorporating in his famous work on general relativity, which is the theory of gravity, he assumed that the universe was static and he had to insert certain fudge factors into his equations, which he would later perhaps apocryphally call his biggest blunder, but maybe not. And these these factors are all meant to keep the universe constant, which was in agreement with the data that was present at the time. Only after folks like Hubble and, and Henrietta Swan-Levitt and others came up with data and tools measuring tapes, basically, that stretched beyond the, the limits of our galaxy into other galaxies did folks like Hubble and, and others and his colleagues realize that the universe was changing and actually things that were in the great distance from our galaxy were actually not only galaxies themselves, but they were galaxies that were moving away from our own galaxy at tremendous speeds, fractions of the speed of light. And so this was a great mystery how that could occur. And it brought up another problem. So it solved one problem. It meant that the universe was changing. But if you took that supposition seriously, the universe is bigger tomorrow than it is today or is smaller yesterday, well, what if you go back in you know, near infinite number of yesterdays, you go back a trillion yesterdays or so, and you come to the beginning of time, and in that state, the universe would have every piece of matter in contact with every other piece of matter. And when that happens, you have potential for an infinite amount of temperature and, and, and energy present in a finite volume, or perhaps infinitesimally small volume. And that was sort of incomparable and, and unknown within the laws of physics. So that Big Bang theory, which is the expansionary observation that we had, that the galaxies are moving away from each other and from us, led to an, un, you know, an unknown new question, which was what happened when these things started off on their journey away from themselves? And secondly, what caused that to happen? And that brought up the notion of the theory of inflation, which is the way I describe inflation if you see the universe expanding and getting bigger and you liken it to this expansion explosion, if you will, although it's not really an explosion, but inflation would be the spark, the initial kick that ignited that explosion into being. And we do not have evidence for it in a hard physical sense yet. And my experiment, BICEP, was designed to be the first experiment to come up with indirect evidence that that epoch existed and that the universe was suffused with a new type of energy called gravitational wave energy or gravitational radiation. And that would be the harbinger not only that the universe had a beginning, but it perhaps could be accompanied by an infinite host of other universes in what's called the multiverse. In fact, we later, as I describe in the book, did discover just that, or thought we did. So what's the relationship between the gravitational waves, which are theoretical, and the cosmic microwave background, which we know exists. Yeah, so the microwave background, as you point out, was discovered in 1965. It resulted in the first Nobel Prize for Cosmology in 1978 to Penzias and Wilson. And this was evidence that the universe had originated, at least at some period of time, for a period of less than 30 minutes or so, had experienced a time uh, a duration of time in which the temperature, the average heat, if you had a thermometer back then, would have been adequate to fuse nuclei together. So to overcome the repulsive force between like charges, like protons to protons, to bind two protons and two neutrons, say, into a helium nucleus. And so that period of time is called nucleosynthesis. And so what Penzias and Wilson discovered was that the conditions were ripe for the formation of the elements for at least a period of 20 minutes or so. And that must have occurred billions of years in the past. But what they did not 
really show is what caused that temperature to be so high in the first place. For that, you would need another theory. And at the time, they didn't really have a good theory for that. And later in the 1980s, were predictions made by theorists such as Alan Guth and Paul Steinhardt and others that the universe, if it originated in an extremely unusual condition with something called a quantum field persisting throughout all space, then at a certain moment in time, that quantum field could produce the heat and energy needed to cause the universe to accelerate and expand from a microscopic size to a finite size in an almost infinitesimal amount of time. And that period we call inflation, but there is no direct tangible evidence. There's no video cameras, obviously. There's not even in the case of the formation of the elements that Penzias and Wilson found, there is a fossil relic that persists to this day in the form of leftover heat from the Big Bang's nucleosynthesis era. And that's what they discovered. We're trying to discover not waves of light or heat as they discovered, Penzias and Wilson, but waves of gravity, which would be associated with the violent explosive expansion of the earliest moments in time. This is a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the origin of the observable universe, not three minutes. There's a huge gap in time between trillions of a second and minutes after the Big Bang. And that's what we were aiming to discover with BICEP and its successor BICEP2, because we figured, or I figured, if they won a Nobel Prize for discovering you know, what happened in the first three minutes, I would certainly win Nobel Prize for discovering what happened at the earliest possible time in the universe's physical history which is necessary condition to produce the CMB, was that the universe had this type of beginning, or we believed it did. And yet we didn't have any hard data suggesting that. So what was unique about the way that my colleagues and I approached this problem was that we decided to use the photons from the CMB, from this cosmic microwave background radiation, this three Kelvin background. We would use those as our detectors of waves of gravity in the way that I describe in the book that actually photons can get affected by gravity even if there's no matter around. So if the the universe has these waves of gravity present in the earliest moments, they will afflict and affect how the photons propagate to our telescopes today. And so we sought out that signal using a specially designed tiny telescope at the South Pole called BICEP. I want to take a quick break just to ask you for your help. When I started Books and Ideas in 2006, I did my own editing. Fortunately, I now have an excellent editor named Danny Osmond, but of course his work isn't free. That's the reason I started a Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash books and ideas. If you would like to help Books and Ideas keep going, please consider making a small monthly pledge. Or, if you prefer to make a one-time donation, you can use Venmo, where my username is, as always, Doc Artemis. So if the the universe has these waves of gravity present in the earliest moments, they will afflict and affect how the photons propagate to our telescopes today. And so we sought out that signal using a specially designed tiny telescope at the South Pole called BICEP. Okay, so what you're saying is that the gravitational waves ought to make it so that the background microwave is not just like white noise. I mean, it doesn't look all exactly the same. It should have signs of these gravitational waves in its signal, and that's what you're looking for? Exactly, except um, you're very perceptive that it, it is white noise. There's another property, so I should back up. White noise means that it's sort of equal amounts of energy at all frequencies. That's a rough way to say that. And another way to say that is black body radiation or, or, or this thermal radiation. So anything that you heat up that's made of normal matter, it'll glow at a given a characteristic color depending on what temperature you raise it to. So the sun is mostly greenish yellow because it's glowing at about 5,500 degrees above absolute zero. Now you can't see the microwaves from the microwave background because they're at three Kelvin. So they're thousands of times longer wavelength. And in fact, we see them, we see white noise at a wavelength of about two millimeters. So not half a micron as we see with the visible light from the sun. Now, what we are looking for is a thermal heat that is what's called polarized. That means that all the photons in the light that we see and we hope to see 
are marching up and down in a plane in a sort of a characteristic pattern that would be indicative, uniquely so, of this inflationary origin of the universe. And that's called curl mode polarization. Curl like you do with your biceps, hence the name for you medical aficionados out there. Uh, <laughs> that's the extent of my medical knowledge. As my, my kids point out, I'm a doctor, but not the kind like you that helps people. I try to understand the origin of the universe and along in so doing, I create corny puns. And one of them was that the, the acronym BICEP stands for Background Imaging of Cosmic Extragalactic Polarization because the signal that we're looking for would be a twisting, curling, rolling kind of pattern if you could see these microwaves in the first place. And furthermore, if you could see their polarization state with your eyes, which of course you can't. So talk a little bit about the challenges of trying to detect these waves, since obviously it's not easy or someone would have already done it. Yeah. So as most things in astronomy, it starts with money and you need to have, uh, well, I should say you need to have an idea, but having a good idea and having a clever idea and wanting to search for something are by no means sufficient conditions to being able to actually go out and do it. In our case, I was at Caltech. I go through a you know, the any kind of the timeline in, in my history after going through graduate school and starting off as a postdoc at Stanford, I became transfixed with this idea, which I had heard from a, what's called a theoretical cosmologist. So someone who only thinks of the equations and the, and the facts and the data that we know already, but you know, he or she doesn't come up with new data and, and new technology to potentially observe these phenomena that he or she might predict. In our case, we're building a telescope and then getting the data that could refute the hypothesis that a theorist has made, namely that the universe began with inflation, for example. So what we had to do is use this idea, and the key insight that I had is that you could do it with a relatively inexpensive telescope, but it would have to be located in a very special part of the planet, namely at the bottom of the world in Antarctica, and not just anywhere in Antarctica, but really at the South Pole, which is the near central portion of the Antarctic continent, which sits on about 9,000 feet of solid ice and therefore takes you 9,000 feet of the way into space, which actually is the best place to do your research like this, looking for photons from the Big Bang and gravitational waves. But in fact, it's, a, it's very expensive. It could be a 100 or a 1,000 times more expensive to go to space. So having an idea, wanting to test it out in a small prototype fashion that could indicate if this was possible, even in principle, to succeed. And so we built a telescope, and the way the telescope worked, it's a refracting telescope, which means it uses lenses, identical to the type of telescope that Galileo used. And Galileo comes up a lot in my book because, among other things, you know, he's credited with being the first observational astronomer. He's credited with being the first physicist to use the scientific method. In collecting evidence. He was an experimental physicist. He was a telescope maker. Even though he didn't invent the telescope, he used it in a unique way. And, and I felt very much kinship with him, not nearly as intellectually proficient as he is, but nevertheless being able to be captivated by what I saw. And the other, other thing that unites me and Galileo and, and my colleagues as well sometimes is that sometimes you set off to see something or prove a scientific argument, and then you do just that. And that's sort of what happened with the BICEP2 project, which is a successor to the original BICEP1 project that I invented, which is that we, you know, we set out to discover what the universe was like in its first moments, its first trillionths of a second, and even earlier. And then what we saw later on was really evidence that we had been looking for. And that's a very unusual situation to be in in science, when there's something that's so hard to get to and so difficult to achieve Many people say you'll never achieve it, and then you achieve it, <laughs> and then you're sort of in this very, very delicate position where you're waiting for other people to see if you did it right. And that's where things kind of went off the tracks for us. So is this a good time to talk about the role of Dust as the evil character in the story? <laughs> yeah, I would say Dust is the uh, villain of the story, but it's not entirely you know, villainous because I should say what dust really means in the cosmic context. It's not that there's dust on the lens cap of the telescope. It's that throughout all cosmic structures, from the Earth to the solar system, to the galaxy, to the intergalactic medium, there is the remnants of previously lived stars. 
And in fact, the Earth itself is really the byproduct and owes its existence to the presence of a star that lived in our local neighborhood of the galaxy probably five billion years ago and then exploded. And then it's the treatise that it was made of, namely the last things that it could really put together to make a fusion energy were things like iron and nickel and cobalt and things like that. After that occurs, the star can't support its own weight and collapses and then explodes outward in what's called a type 2 supernova. When that happens, fragments of the star kind of litter throughout the entire galaxy. And over millions or billions of years, those fragments, the explosive detritus, can coagulate and become little tiny bodies of solar system-like material, like planets or asteroids and moons. Uh, and so we believe all of the cores of all of our planet, uh, of the planets in the solar system, including the Earth and the asteroid belt and things like that, are all the byproducts in the, uh, the former guts of a star that exploded 5 billion years ago or more. That process of forming planets is not completely efficient. There's a lot of stuff left over, and you can characterize its scale depending on how big it is. It could be an asteroid if it's you know tens or hundreds of kilometers across. It could be a planet if it's much bigger than that. It could be a meteoroid if it's much smaller than that. And if it makes it through the Earth's atmosphere and lands on the ground, it could be a meteorite. So if you ever held a small meteorite, it's typically metallic and it's typically magnetic because it's made of iron or cobalt or nickel. And it has other things in it. But that uh, material can be even smaller. And so you can get little tiny grains the size of a grain of sand made of the same material from the same parent supernova. And that material can have other effects. That material can then essentially reproduce the pattern that we were looking for. In other words, it can produce the same kind of curl pattern of polarization with the same white noise spectrum at the same white uh, cosmic black body temperature that we're looking for. And in fact, we knew that that was a possibility back in 2014 when we announced we discovered evidence for cosmic inflation and received tremendous numbers of mentions for Nobel Prizes and for greatest discoveries ever and the multiverse being detected. But in reality, we always knew that there was lurking in the data the possibility that we detected merely the imprimatur, not of inflation, but of cosmic schmutz floating around our galaxy, not in the early universe, but in our own galaxy. In other words, several millions or billions of miles away or trillions of miles away, but in our own galaxy, not far from our own portion of, of the Milky Way galaxy. It was only through long painstaking process after we had already self-published the results and gotten this great fanfare that other teams looked at our data and started to question it. And that felt very much like what my hero Galileo must have experienced going through the Inquisition, because <laughs> uh, it was a very grueling and incredibly stressful period of time in my life, as I talk about in the book. So let's back up in history a little, back to Galileo and how dust led him astray. Yeah, I always say, you know, dust is, is sort of this villainous entity, but it also has some very good aspects too. As I said, there is iron, there is nickel, cobalt. All those things are present in the earth and they're very valuable. We use them as resources. Not only does the earth, you know, people use them as, you know, for building things and constructing things, but it's actually used by nature, if you will, to construct us. In other words, the hemoglobin, as you can tell me much better than I can tell you, and hemoglobin has iron molecules. So those iron molecules, as Carl Sagan once said, are star stuff. They're basically the same products that got into the Earth's ground. They got absorbed into your body, and it's quite miraculous, your mother's body. It's quite miraculous how this occurs, and that without the supernova, the same one that produced the dust that bespoiled our Nobel, my Nobel Prize chances, <laughs> is actually you know flowing through my veins right now. And as Carl Sagan also said, you know, we're basically the Earth is a giant moat of dust suspended on a sunbeam floating through space. So I don't want to get the idea that, you know, I want a dust free universe and I'm <laughs> going to create a dust buster to suck it all up. But what Galileo had is slightly different. He was, of course, not the first person to even use a telescope and not the first person to come up with the concept that the Earth is not the center of the universe or at least the solar system. Many other people had conjectured that, most famously Copernicus, but no one had observational evidence 
that there were any other centers of the universe besides the Earth, because it sure appears that way, that the Earth is the center of the solar system. And you know, throughout history, there were epicycles added on by various scientists to make the data, as it came in, more consistent with an Earth-centered cosmology. But Galileo said, when he looked at the planet Jupiter, he saw that it was attended to by four bright stars, which later turned out to be not stars at all. And he realized he was looking at moons or satellites of Jupiter, four of which uh, went around the planet the same way our moon goes around the Earth. And so these Jovian moons were not going around the Earth at all. They were clearly going around Jupiter with the periodicity ranging from you know several days to several weeks. And he sketched them over the course of a few weeks. And in that book, most famous book in scientific astronomical history, at least, the Sidereus Nuncius, or Starry Messenger, he also came up with other pieces of evidence or other things that he claimed also gave perhaps credence to the notion that we are not special in the organization of the universe, just as we were not part of the center of the solar system, according to Galileo and Copernicus. He also said the sun is not really the center of the universe. It's not really that special, even though it might be the center of our solar system, which he didn't prove, by the way. That would take another hundred or so years to prove. But nevertheless, he noted that the sun was the center of at least our solar system. But in doing so, he said, well, there are other stars in the Milky Way in this tiny cluster of stars called the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, that little grouping of stars is purely made of stars and stars alone, and such is the nature of the entirety of the Milky Way. When, in fact, nowadays we know that the Pleiades are, are kind of filthy with dust, <laughs> and so too is our galaxy. And in fact, there might be tremendous numbers of, of masses, of solar masses worth of suns, but in the form of dust, in our own galaxy. And it's fascinating to think about how he wanted to prove or motivate his scientific hypothesis so much that he would overlook the evidence that his telescope provided him when it suited him to make an argument. Another reason I like him so much is because he's very human. He, he makes all these mistakes and, and he does so and the exact same reasons that I and my colleagues make, you know, that, that we want to get prestige or, you know, we wanna, I want to get uh, tenure. And, and these are things that were important to Galileo too. He was a human being. And he had all the attendant foibles, including confirmation bias, which is a very pernicious type of cognitive affliction that scientists are no different than average, you know, lay people in needing to confront and overcome. So in your book, you have a number of really helpful illustrations, but I want to make sure I understand this one idea. You show a picture of a plane in a cloud and talk about how that creates an optical illusion. Would you talk about that for a minute and how that could relate to how dust could make us, and I'm talking about the visible misinformation, what kind of ways that could lead us astray? Yes, I do believe that the Earth is still, by many, seen as being tantamount in some way of importance, at least, if not physical centrality. And I go through in the book how... It's a natural supposition to have. And in fact, the questions really weren't fully resolved for many, many decades or hundreds of years, even after Galileo. This illustration they're talking about is really one that you can verify anytime you're on a plane inside of a cloud flying from wherever you may be going. And that is that the perception of something depends partially on what notion you have going into it. So if you go into it thinking you are the center of the plane or you're inside this cloud, you will be naturally persuaded by the evidence that your eyes and your senses present to you, which is sure does look like you're at the center of the galaxy, our center of the plane, our center of the cloud. Even if the cloud doesn't really have a center at all, it could be a huge pancake with uh, some lobes on it or whatever, and you just might be in one of those tiny lobes near the outskirts. And that's exactly the situation we're in in the galaxy. Now, what's the similarity between the cloud? There's not giant globs of water molecules in space presenting this illusion to us. Instead, it's dust, again, dust that has the same effect of scattering, dimming, and in the case of what I care about, polarizing the light that we see. And because we don't really have a polarization-sensitive nature of our eyes, we have a slight one. It's called the macula. Inside your macula, you have a type of pigment which is slightly sensitive to polarization, so some people can sense polarized effects. 
But nevertheless, we can't really see that in the plane. And so I give this analogy that we're really not in a plane at all. We're on a spaceship. And instead of being inside a plane inside of a cloud, we're a spaceship, namely the Earth, floating inside of a giant galactic cloud, in this case, mostly of dust in the context that I care about. So what we now know is that we're at the edge of the Milky Way, but it's one little, one galaxy of billions? Yeah, well, you can think of the Milky Way as sort of a compact disc or a DVD-shaped object with uh, with a good deal of accuracy missing from that. But we're sort of two-thirds the way out from the center of that disc in what's called the spiral arm. And our Milky Way galaxy, we know, has about 100 billion stars within it. And then from observations of things like the Hubble Space Telescope's ultra-deep field, the Hubble Deep Field, we get a glimpse of about the same number of galaxies in the observable universe. In other words, there's 100 billion galaxies or more, and each one has about 100 billion stars in it or more. And each one of those stars could have 10 or 100 planets within it. So you're talking about numbers that are like 10,000 billion billion stars, and then 100 times that number of planets. And then you naturally would wonder, well, how many of those are like the Earth, et cetera? So the universe is tremendously capacious. And just as we know that there's many planets besides the Earth, and we know there's many stars besides the Sun, and then we know there's many galaxies besides the Milky Way, as I said, the natural supposition would be maybe there's other universes that we can't see beyond our own observable universe. That's called the multiverse. Okay, one, one last dust question. I remember the first time I was out in the desert and actually got to see the Milky Way. If you're somewhere where you can actually see and understand why the Milky Way is called the Milky Way, are you looking at dust? Are you looking at light reflected off of dust in between the stars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're looking basically at a combination of all those things. And depending on where you are, you might even see the evidence for dust is actually the absence of light. And that's quite fascinating to think about. Because the absence of light is usually thought of as nothingness. But in this case, it's absorption. It's like a cloud of soot, of polarized, metallic, little grains of soot that absorb and polarize light from the objects behind it, namely from the cosmic background radiation, but also are visible to the naked human eye. And yes, the Milky Way is called that in many cultures because it looks like spilled milk. But between some of the bright parts of the Milky Way, you'll see vast, dark splotches. And those are places where dust is absorbing the light of the stars that are actually there and are obscuring it. Similar in that vein, dust can absorb and polarize and dim the light of microwaves from the early universe, namely the signal that we were trying to see originally. So what are you working on now? I assume you haven't given up on your project. So how are you fixing it? I am not still very heavily involved with the BICEP project. They've created a few more telescopes since the one described in the book. They're on the fourth generation of these telescopes now. It's still located at the South Pole, Antarctica. I joke, you know, I was going to call my book because it's about me kind of leaving the BICEP project. I was going to call it a farewell to arms, but that title was taken apparently. <laughs> and so I, um, I am now very privileged to be the director of a competing project which is still looking for these signals from the early universe, but many other signals as well. And that's called the Simons Observatory. Now, this project we broke ground for in a ceremony this past summer and in in winter in the, in the Southern Hemisphere is located in the northern Atacama Desert of Chile at an elevation of over 17,000 feet above sea level. It's a fascinating project. We've got plans for four massive telescopes, and it will have capabilities, at least 100 times more capability than the BICEP project that I originally created. So it's just a really phenomenal and fascinating project to be involved with. And what we're doing is we're learning lessons from the BICEP experience that you cannot only look for the cosmic signals. You have to look for other signals in order to hit cosmic pay dirt. You have to look for dirt itself, namely dust, namely have parts of your telescope or maybe a whole telescope itself dedicated only to look for dust. Then. If you do see a signal, we would be able to combine the uh, expectation signal and then subtract the dust-only signal, and that would then potentially reveal that the universe did have, in fact, this inflationary origin. 
that I started this discussion off with. Did the universe have a prologue? And if so, what would it be like? So when do you anticipate, best case, that you would actually get this kind of data? Well, we're in the construction process now. We broke ground, as I said, ceremonially this past summer in uh, July. And we are planning to have the first telescopes installed at the end of 2021. And then we have, as I said, four massive telescopes to deploy. And that will probably take us to the end of 2022 before they're all installed and all the detectors are working and calibrated. And then we have a five-year science program to acquire data. And then it could take a year or two years to acquire enough data. I won't say, you know, what I expect to see because we've learned, I've learned that lesson. (laughs) It is very dangerous to, to kind of come up with these expectations. And so I can't wait to see what we see. And if we see nothing at all, it will also be incredibly interesting. It will drastically constrain how the universe is comprised. And we also, with one of our very large telescopes, uh, something like 30 times larger than the original BICEP telescope, that this telescope will be able to see the properties of galaxy clusters and the dark matter that they are suffused with. And I think that's going to be opening new directions in my career into very fascinating aspects of the fundamental nature of the universe. Sounds like lots of opportunity for grad students, too. Yeah, we have a lot of openings here in the Simons Observatory collaboration. You can find out more about the Simons Observatory at simonsobservatory.org, all one word. And uh, yeah, we have job openings that pop up there all the time, not just for students, but for technicians, engineers, etc. Well, I'm going to come back to the issue of students at the very end, but how are you on time? Are you real tight? I need to go in seven minutes. Seven minutes? (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to give you a choice. Would you rather share your advice for students or talk more about the Nobel Prize? I don't know how large the relative audience is for students potentially listening. And I think the book is kind of a nice introduction to what it's like to be a starting graduate student all the way up to being a full professor. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about the Nobel Prize, seeing as tomorrow's Albert's death day. Okay. So what are the major problems? I would say there's at least two that really come to mind. One is that people who were eligible had their recognition stolen away from them, typically because they were in positions of inferiority in terms of power or power structure. And because of that, I think it distorts the way that science is done to say that Vera Rubin discovered pulsars But the Nobel Prize and the glory and the money and and so forth goes to her advisor, her male advisor, because, you know, she couldn't have possibly done it without him. When a graduate student that I mentioned in the very beginning, Russell Hulse, he also had a graduate advisor, and yet they didn't think that he couldn't have done it without his, you know, they gave him the Nobel Prize. Uh, Similar, Rosalind Franklin, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all things where you have a power dynamic that keeps getting reinforced for one reason, because the Nobel Prize is selected by a very small number of mostly male scientists in Sweden. It's not well known. It's sort of people think it's this grand organization of physicists from around the world that select it, but it's really the ultimate authority is with the Swedish Academy of Sciences. So I was asked to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prize in 2016, and that's what started me on this quest to understand, well, what is going on with this with this award, and why did I want to win it so badly, and, and what can be done about it? You know, number two is there's a restriction which was added about 80 years after Alfred Nobel, the patron of the Nobel Prize, died, which is that you couldn't win the Nobel Prize if you were deceased. So technically, even if you died, the, you know, today and you're going to get your award tomorrow, they changed it in 1974 to a situation where you could not win it posthumously. There was never an Alfred's will. It had nothing, no real origin in his will or any of his desires, especially since he only endowed the prize after feeling guilty, perhaps, over creating dynamite and wanting the the prize to kind of rehabilitate the Nobel name. Nevertheless, he would never, potentially, would would not have condoned this. And I I asked the question, what if you do die the day before? And in fact, a couple of years ago, this physician Steigman, he died a couple of days before the announcement was made. And Some say, you know, accuse the family of keeping that a secret so that he would win it. And some say that's preposterous. I I don't really know the truth. I think uh, it's probably quite complex. But they ended up awarding it to him posthumously. And throughout history, there have been people like Rosalind Franklin who did die 
years before the Nobel Prize was actually awarded for the discovery of DNA to Watson and Crick. But her work at the time was eligible for the Nobel Prize. That was in the 50s. And she didn't die until much, you know, it's well before the 1974 deadline uh, or rules changed. So I think they could change the rules and it would redound to the benefit of science as a whole. And you also mentioned making teams eligible. Yeah. So the Nobel Peace Prize can be won by hundreds or thousands of people, as happened before. And so there's no way, in my opinion, to really identify what scientist was not essential to the discovery that was awarded the Nobel Prize. And, and this happened in 2011, you know, with the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe, teams of 40, 50 people, yet three people alone were selected. Or the discovery of the Higgs boson in the following year, in 2012, that ushered in kind of a huge controversy because people felt like there were 6,000 people who were part of this experiment, none of whom won the prize, and only two theorists out of the possible seven or eight who are actual inventors of the Higgs particle in the field of theoretical physics, none of those you know, 6,005 people won. To me, it distorts science, and it distorts how the public perceives science because it perpetuates this myth of the lone genius male usually working by himself in his lab and then doing it all himself in the you know Frank Sinatronian way. And it's just not accurate. I have a team that's 250 plus people, 40 institutions, you know, 20 countries. And it's just a phenomenal thing for me. And I think until we see the Nobel Prize as kind of the the Oscars and and, and so forth and, and really demerit that because science isn't about prize money and credit and, and giving quotes in newspapers and so forth. It's about the pursuit of truth. That's what science means. It means knowledge. And our privilege as scientists is to get paid to do what we would do for free. And that's a dirty little secret that we all love it so much. We'd probably figure out a way to do it for free. I like that. Well, Brian, I have really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you have too. And I hope the next time you write a book, you'll make sure I get a copy of it. Absolutely. Thanks, Jenny. It's a pleasure talking to you. I really enjoyed talking to Dr. Brian Keating about his fascinating book, Losing the Nobel Prize, a story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's highest honor. I highly recommend this book to anyone who is fascinated by the mystery of the origins of our universe. It would also make a great gift for any young aspiring scientist because it provides a candid account of the pitfalls of striving for the glory of a Nobel Prize. But rather than trying to sum up the interview, I would like to mention that this book really has three main threads. One is the story of how our current view of cosmology has developed, going back, of course, to Galileo. Next, Keating shares his own personal journey as a scientist with all its ups and downs, including the loss of his beloved mentor. And finally, there is his critique of the Nobel Prize itself. I assume this has probably generated a lot of conversation both inside and outside of science. Losing the Nobel Prize combines a personal story with a fascinating science mystery, and it provides a candid look at how science is really done by human beings. To my mind, these qualities make it an important contribution to any discussion of the role of science in contemporary society. I would love to hear what you thought about today's episode. You can send me feedback at docartemis at gmail.com. You can also find the show notes at booksandideas.com. You can send me voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis. And don't forget to visit the Books and Ideas fan page on Facebook. I also want to thank those of you who have been sending me emails so that I know that someone is actually listening. I have to admit that after releasing an episode every month in 2019, I'm a little disappointed that the audience remains very small compared to brain science. I did put the December episode of Books and Ideas into the brain science feed, but I would love to hear your suggestions about how to get more brain science fans to listen to Books and Ideas too. Of course, 
I also hope that each of you will share the show with others. And if you're able, I hope you'll consider supporting the show via Patreon or Venmo. For Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash books and ideas. For Venmo, my username is Doc Artemis. Your support will help to offset the cost of audio editing. The show will be back next month on the 15th of February. Until then, I hope you will listen to my other podcasts, Brain Science and Graying Rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Books and Ideas is copyright 2020 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy it to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at docartemis at gmail.com. Theme music for Books and Ideas is The Open Door by Beatnik Turtle. Please visit their website at beatnikturtle.com.